Okay, good morning. Okay. Welcome to the Tree County Board of Supervisors for August 20th. the board please state your name for the record and address the board as a whole through the chair no action or discussion will be conducted on matters not listed on the agenda however the chair may refer the subject matter to the appropriate department for follow-up or schedule the matter on subsequent board agenda. good morning john good morning um i am sorry for the outcome of the search and rescue this weekend but i think that uh, we need to reevaluate moving the oes office to another location because being at the airport was very effective for the operation of the search and rescue. Uh, there's plenty of room on the airport off of Tom Bell Road that you could build a new building there. And I highly recommend keeping it at the airport because even during fire season, it's nice having the helicopters right outside the door of OAS. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Go ahead. Okay. My name is Jim Stula. I'm out of Hayport, California. Uh, I'd like to read a chapter from the uh, California Constitution. It says here, Every tax shall be conclusively presumed to have been paid after 30 years from the time it became a lien, unless the property subject to the lien has been sold in a manner provided by the legislature for that payment of the tax. I've owned my property for 40 years. The county has been extorting money out of me for a 10-year period of time on, on my property. But this is this is a benefit that, that you get a privilege that you get to uh, own your property, and I don't care for the county subject if you meet the tax after the 30-year period of time. <coughs> it's extortion. Thank you. Kay Graves from Lewiston. Hopefully I can get through this in three minutes. Um, this has to do with uh, Jared Huffman's uh, bill, uh, 2250, and it pertains to uh, federal ownership of land in general. Um, Jared Huffman uses the constitutionality of his bill is um, Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2. Um, to exercise legislative executive legislation in all cases whatsoever over district not oh sorry i'm reading the first one wrong i knew that was a clause too there we go congress shall have the power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory and other property and property is capitalized belonging to the united states and nothing in this constitution shall be construed to prejudice any claims of the state or any particular state to own land is um, Section 8, yeah. Article 2. Um, to exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over districts not exceeding 10 square miles. This is when they created Washington, D.C. As may, by secession of particular states and the acceptance of Congress become the seat of the government of the United States and to exercise like authority over all places, which is capitalized, purchased by the consent of the legislator of the state in which the same shall be and for the erection of forts magazines arsenals dockyards and other needful buildings so since when is the forest forest of building 
So not only does it say how you can get the land, it has to be ceded by the state, it says what you can use it for, and the Forest Service is, meets none of that requirement. Also, in the Act Entering California into the Union, Section 3, that's, that the said state of California is admitted into the Union upon the express condition that the people of the state, through their legislation or otherwise, shall never interfere with the primary disposal of public lands within its limits. Federal government was always supposed to dispose of land they didn't. They eventually sat on it and said they owned it. I have a copy of my patent that goes to my land that my land is now deeded to. Mm -hmm. It's from the General Land Office of the United States. It's from 1875 when Harrison Fox purchased the land from the federal government is how it was supposed to be dispersed. Signed by Ulysses S. Grant. After the patent, the original patent deeds were created from that. So they do not own the land. I've showed you repeatedly they do not own the land, and I expect you as our representatives to act on that. Thank you. Good morning, Diana Sheen, Leader Bell. So, um, I want to uh, give you a visual to add to last year's 2018 informal poll at the Trinity County Fair that um, contrary to what is said and said in the Trinity Journal, uh, the uh, Trinity County people uh, uh, that they want the bill to um, 2250, um, I would like to uh, give you a um, handout of a copy of the informal poll that we took this year at the fair and I would like to give that to the board of supervisors so there's a lot more folks that do not want it and they express themselves and there was even uh, I'm not going to, they're going to remain nameless, but there's folks that you all know that do not want that bill to go through. So please tell Jared Huffman, who is uh, playing to his constituents in the Bay Area and Marin County, um, that we do not want that here in Trinity County. Please do not write that letter for the uh, collaborative. Thank you. Are you here for your 10 o'clock item? No. Okay. Uh, my name is Dan Booty, and I'm from Hayfork. Um, I'm, I'm here to make a public comment about the trans situation of our transfer station. Um, we're constantly having issues with certain members of the community in Hayfork breaking into the transfer station after hours and vandalizing it. Um, and I've, I've left many messages for Diane Rader about the USDA um, Rural Development Grant that is actually, we qualify for, um, that we, um, I, I know the CAO now has a grant writer where we could uh, write in a grant to the USDA to get funds to improve the facilities at the transfer station, specifically maybe putting a building up where all those dumpsters could get locked away at night um, it's really a sad situation when you go up there and you see the two county workers instead of like being able to help a older gentleman with his trash literally spending their entire shift just picking up garbage like that to me isn't a effective use of county funds and I feel like it, you know there's other potential environmental hazards from the trash just being strewn about and I really implore the board to do whatever is necessary and talk to whatever department lead is out there in order to make this uh, infrastructure improvement a possibility because the, the trap, again, the trap situation at the transfer station in Hayfork is really, it's uh, egregious and needs some attention. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'd like to say, the Burt Ranch transfer station, it's a similar situation down there. The tops to the bins don't close all the way, the bears get in every night. And 
disperse the trash up the hill, and uh, Julie has to go and spend hours of the day climbing up the steep embankment to pick up trash. And then we're also right by the river, so it creates a uh, bad situation. So I'd be supportive of that. Um, USDA will be up uh, toward the end of next month regarding uh, grant rural grants and a few other items. And uh, there's already a shovel ready, uh, I believe there's a shovel ready plan that came up a few years ago for the April grant. It's just funny. But USD's grant would probably be a loan. So I don't know if we want to put ourselves in debt. But that's something we will discuss. So Richard, could you, uh, given the, the two locations that have been mentioned, can you kind of look into that, where we're at? It's been kind of an ongoing issue up and down. Um, and, and it could be a money issue, or there, there, is there grants, loans? I don't, I don't know what the solution is, but I'm sure you will find I out. I will find out. <laughs> and, and it includes Diane Baker. Yes, of course. She yeah. has to be in the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. 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 So I, I'm glad this was re-brought up. Um, I want to thank Diane and her um, lead person. We had met at the Hay Fork Transfer Station. No that long ago, but when I think about it, it could have been last year. It seems like time goes really fast. But um, it was really wet and yucky. It was at its worst condition. And they made an incredible list because we do have the bear farms and um, the, the, the main um, building where our people uh, admit has been vandalized as well and broken into. And so I, I, I know that Diane has many things and is very busy, but uh, she spent a whole afternoon out there. But I, I'm glad to see this back before the board. Thank you, Diane. All right, anyone else? Public comment. All right, uh, before we move on to presentations, I do want to say um, thank you to Sheriff Saxon and his department and all of Search and Rescue. They've been busy all week. I'm sad for the outcome, and I know you have probably another search continuing. So. Thank you, Sheriff, and please pass the word to everyone involved. Um, moving on to presentations 1.1, receive a presentation from Y Green Energy Fund Director of Program Development, and Emily Goodwin, regarding the California Home, uh, Home Finance Authority PACE Program, no fiscal impact. Um, right. Supervisor Brown, I believe you brought this forward. Do you want to do any quick overview of the introduction? Um, no, I just want to say thanks to Emily for making the trip up here for the presentation. Um, uh, I was exposed to the program and thought it would make something some of the residents of Trinity County were interested in. Um, so I'll let Emily talk about it. And I would add that this is a different company than that was before us a couple years ago. So, no? Oh. No, they were both before us. Oh, they were. We just beat up the other company first. <laughs> That's why I stuck in my office. Why we had the, the easy part. Oh, okay. My apologies. Well, thank you, everybody. Good morning, uh, board and members of the public. It's great to be here. What a beautiful spot um, in the state. I, I don't know that I've ever been here before, but we used to come camping up in this part of the state um, as a child growing up in the North Bay. So. Um, it's a real joy to be here. I will say I acknowledge the passing through Shasta County and the fire damage was so incredible. Um, quite humbling and, and, you know, really haunting uh, is all I can say. So I just sort of wanted to acknowledge that. Um, certainly we have our own experience of that in Sonoma County where I live. Um, our company is based in Sonoma County. Uh, moving on to brighter topics. Um, we are a PACE finance company. Why green is the word energy spelled backwards. It's a little play on words, sort of reversing the energy trend. It was founded over a decade ago by a developer in Emily. Sonoma County. Emily? Oh, sorry. Just that to the board. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. That's right. uh, and so, uh, uh, PACE stands for Property Assessed Clean Energy. Uh, it's a way of accessing the capital locked in uh, homes and businesses to make energy efficient uh, improvements, uh, water conservation measure improvements, uh, deploy uh, solar and some other renewable energy sources, mostly solar, um, electric vehicle charging infrastructure uh, and now fire prevention measures um, that was passed uh, as of last year. Uh, we are a, uh, a program administrator of PACE and we're governed by a joint powers authority uh, which is through the rural counties of California 
um, Golden State Finance Authority is our JPA partner. Um, and so the way the program works is we present to uh, cities and boards throughout the state, the cities uh, and board of supervisors throughout the state to um, uh, showcase what we do and see if it's something that you all would approve. Uh, and then once we're approved at a um, local public meeting, um, the, count, the program runs sort of seamlessly um, uh, turnkey so that there's no imposition on county funds um, or staff uh, to monitor the program. PACE originally started as a municipal program, excuse me, a county program. Um, and so with the appetite there um, in the market and the need for uh, private companies to address that market, one, you know, we, we were born, so to speak. So um, I like to make that comment just so that folks understand that um, this is really a, a program that was devised to address the issues of climate change um, and to try to reduce our greenhouse gas emission toll on the state, um, address the water shortage in the state, um, and then as I mentioned in the beginning, the portfolio of eligible improvements that we can finance has expanded over time, most recently with fire prevention, um, rightly so. So what is property assessed clean energy financing? I sort of went over that. The name is, a, is really addresses it all. It's a way to unlock the capital that's uh, stuck in the equity and properties and allow property owners to make these eligible improvements um, with no upfront cost. Um, and terms that go from 5, 10, 15, 20 years, sometimes 30 years for solar. The terms are devised by the, um, the useful life of the improvement, so that's one of the many consumer protections and guardrails of the program. So we don't design the uh, useful life that's determined by the California Energy Commission. Um, so for example, if you got windows replaced, or excuse me, HVAC replaced, you know, you couldn't do a 30 year term for that, right? Because the HVAC unit wouldn't have a useful life of 30 years. And so um, we have those internal protections there um, for the benefit of the consumer. And we don't devise those terms either. Um, we are repaid through the property tax bill. Um, so folks pay twice or once a year based on the property tax bill. They can also um, increase their escrow account so they can make monthly payments so that there's no sort of surprise at the end of the year. Um, it's really between the property owner and their mortgage company. Um, it is now recently based on not only the equity in the property, but ability to pay. So as of 2018, the legislature passed a bill to require that we have the ability to pay our ATP requirements attached to our underwriting criteria. And we think that's a good thing. It's not the way the market used to um, uh, unlock the underwriting capability of the, the property um, and qualified customers. But now we understand that with folks that are on a fixed income or simply just need sort of the, um, the guardrails or controls, if you will, uh, for consumer spending of ability to pay, we address the ability to pay for each individual property owner before we qualify them to use the program. And that's been in place since April 2018, so it is relatively new. Um, there may have been some legacy issues that folks are familiar with, certainly in this room and outside in the state that address um, which you may have seen in the media, um, folks' inability to pay and that surprise when they get their property tax payment. Um, but we've addressed those sort of retroactively. Um, and going forward with the legislature implementing the ATP requirements, those um, sort of situations are uh, legacy. Um, so won't be happening again. Um, I went through some of the uh, eligible improvements here. I think I missed seismic retrofitting, which may not be as big an issue here, but certainly throughout the state in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, they have soft story, uh, soft story uh, seismic requirements, so um, retrofits to ensure safety after an earthquake. Um, and obviously that applies to other parts of the state, but those are the cities um, that have implemented um, code requirements uh, for um, property owners. And so certainly it's, elig it's eligible throughout the state and it's uh, applicable throughout the state depending on the type of property and the location. <laughs> Um, so here are some of the community benefits. It's another option for property improvements. So property home improvement, finance, home improvements, um, uh, commercial building improvements has been going on forever. Uh, we're simply another way for property owners to consider paying for those upgrades. Um, we can't do aesthetic upgrades, uh, so we don't do infinity pools or granite countertops. Um, but we like to say we do the stuff that uh, helps the state um, and uh, allows for that communal attribute, right? So the, the cleaner air, um, the uh, saving of water, um, the deployment of renewable energy, clean energy sources, and now obviously with fire protection, we see that that's a huge communal benefit. Um, we haven't done a fire improvement project yet. Uh, we're looking forward to doing that, but but they're available now, and so um, again, this is one of the big benefits of PACE is that we address the, um, the improvements that are needed to properties throughout the state that have that communal attribute. Um, 
there's rigorous consumer protection policies in place, not only um, internally through our uh, uh, our operations, um, but uh, we're beholden to our joint powers. Question. Uh -huh. Sure. So, are you going to describe what the fire prevention uh, benefits, possibilities, examples of that, or? I certainly can. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So, um, so the passage of uh, AB 465 last year allowed for fire prevention measures. There's a whole suite of um, eligible measures to be added to PACE uh, financing as an eligible way to pay for those improvements. What hasn't happened yet is the clarification on um, high fire impact zones, which is a distinguished um, like regional uh, um, attribution of certain parts of the state established by Cal Fire. I don't know if I explained that um, correctly, but we're still waiting for that clarif clarification to happen um, at the legislature, which will likely take place next year. Um, and so um, that suite of eligible measures would be shingle roof replacement, um, you know, uh, gutter, uh, ceiling gutters. Um, I'm sort of skipping over the, the details of each of those categories, but so, sort of um, the, the fire retardant siding, um, I could certainly send you a list of those measures um, and then give you sort of the categorical descriptions, but sort of your basic stock, um, you know, improvements to make the, the structure more fire resistant. Um, and we will certainly be explaining this in great detail when we're closer to actually implementing a project um, through our Joint Powers Authority Board, which is rural counties of California, um, and through our existing government partners throughout the state, because we know this is a big issue. Um, so, does that address your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Welcome. Um, we have, um, you know, rigorous consumer protection policies. Again, we're beholden to our JPA partner. Um, we're also beholden to our local um, counties um, and regional government associations who in many parts of the state have required additional consumer protections by way of collaborative services agreements. And the reason I'm sharing that with you is the beauty of having to go in front of every city and, and county to be approved is that you all have that um, local control in place for good reason. So if there was something that you wanted to add to the sort of operating rules for which uh, PACE would be allowed in Trinity County, you're certainly welcome to do that. Other counties have done it. They, uh, pre-legislation um, of 2017 and 2018, some of the counties um, and the regional governments, the Metropolitan Transit Authority um, groups throughout the state would enact additional consumer protections through these agreements um, because that's the way they wanted PACE to operate. And I could certainly share with you some examples of that if that would help you feel more comfortable considering the program here in Trinity. Just, just an option. Um, we are now regulated through the Department of Business Oversight. That's important, I think, mostly uh, not only for consumers, but obviously the local governments that we partner with to allow uh, for the financing because there's uh, somebody who we, we have to answer to, right? There's a process for regulation and oversight um, in addition to the, the mechanisms we already have in place and have had in place since we launched the program. Um, <clears throat> one of the unique features of PACE as well is, um, like I said, we're just another option to allow property owners <coughs> to make these home improvements and commercial property improvements. Um, but when you pay with, say, using uh, funds from a HELOC or with a credit card or cash, um, there are certain controls and um, uh, oversight that don't exist for those mechanisms of payment that absolutely are in place and are required through PACE. And one of the unique ones is a confirmed terms call with all of our property owners. And that's done both in English and then any language that's um, native to the property owner. So we have translation services available. Those calls are recorded. There's a script that's provided, and they have to go through each of the financial disclosures that's um, listed in our um, finance agreement. They have to um, ask on a uh, repetitive basis if the customer understands the agreement they're about to enter into, um, if they need any more time to consider the, uh, the uh, project and the scope of the project. They go through the list of eligible uh, measures that the contractor and the property owner have discussed. Um, while considering the, the improvements made so that there's the sort of checks and balances between what the contractor submits in the application process, what the property owner completes on their uh, finance agreement, and then ultimately um, what we're sort of codifying in the contract language. So um, I think that's a really important feature. Um, it's one that we certainly um, are proud of and has helped us really give that confidence to not only the customer but the local governments that we operate with. Um, and again, where did PACE start? It was born out of a need to address uh, uh, cities and counties being tasked with implementing um, measures to reach the AB 32 climate um, change uh, bill um, and in turn the climate action plans that have been uh, put on local cities and counties. 
Um, so we plug into those. We help, uh, we're, we're one of the tools in the quiver, if you will, to help meet those action plan goals. Um, and as well, the economic developments are significant. We help local contractors uh, offer our, our finance option, and we've seen those contractors grow their business two and threefold, which is really heartwarming. It's, a, it's an added, it's not even secondary. In some cases, it's more compelling to local governments than even the environmental benefit and the impact. Um, but it absolutely has made a difference, especially um, in some of the rural communities um, with local small contracting businesses grow their business two or threefold. I've seen those, uh, those stories firsthand. Um, so here's some of the ways that we are distinguished among other ways to pay for um, uh, property improvements that are related to energy efficiency, um, water conservation, or solar. Um, there are all the consumer protections on the left-hand side um, that you can see, and of course, PACE checks all those boxes, and then we compare it to a HELOC, unsecured debt, and then a solar lease or PPA, which obviously would only apply to solar. And this packet, just for members of the public, was made available uh, through the agenda packet that's posted online. Um, here's just a cost comparison. Folks ask, well, how much is that, you know, what are the terms and, uh, of the money that you're uh, providing? Um, and again, uh, we're unlocking the capital in, in, from the equity in the property, and that's where this comes from. Um, we started around 6.5%, can go up to 85 and in some cases 9 but usually in that range. So here's how it compares to some of the other um, traditional uh, finance products that most folks are uh, familiar with. <clears throat> most of the properties um, can go up to 15% of the equity in the property, and generally speaking on average, uh, uh, homeowners, I'll just speak to the, the residential sector, homeowners typically do use and access about 6 to 7% of the equity in the property, so they don't tend to max out, which is a good thing. I think that's important to know. Um, so they, 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 in many cases, they use PACE um, when other me uh, mechanisms to finance are, just aren't available. So when they have emergency um, HVAC replacement needed, you know, we're there, we can make it easy to underwrite um, if the equity is available and they have no mortgage late. Um, they're not bankruptcy, some of the other sort of standard underwriting criteria. If they meet those criteria, we can quickly finance and approve um, these emergency uh, uh, improvement replacements, which are really important in certain parts of the state, depending on what season. And then this is our infographic, and so this is a nationwide infographic. Um, this is uh, something that sort of in a playful way um, uh, generally addresses the, the significant impact we make in the um, reduction of greenhouse gases, water use, um, the deployment of renewable energy, and you'll see on the right, it says lifetime insurance saving and hazard avoidance. Um, the lifetime insurance saving, this speaks to our Florida market, so we're active in Florida and Missouri as well. And in Florida, they have a, 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 a <clears throat> one of the most expensive rates of property uh, insurance because of the hurricane risk. And so um, if you make uh, wind hardening measures there, you can significantly reduce your insurance um, payment uh, for homeowners insurance, which is, um, very, very compelling, obviously, in our Florida market. So that's what that speaks to. We don't have that, that commonality here in California. I just wanted to clarify that piece. And the, the metric on the bottom right is the hazard loss avoidance. And this has been factored in for some of the, um, the uh, seismic retrofitting projects that we've done um, in the state of California. But most of the hazard loss figure is also um, is, is attributed to our Florida market, just to clarify. So when, when and if you know the insurance market can be tied to reductions and in, in premiums um, for you know fire protection measures or seismic, if that's mandated um, by the state, again, that's where you'll see that figure go drastically up in California, and that hasn't happened yet. Um, it's voluntary at this stage for folks to make those improvements in their property. So um, the rest is, um, is our nationwide uh, set of metrics, and um, you'll see it's pretty significant. <clears throat> Uh, this is something that we are very proud of. We implemented a um, voluntary survey at the end of each of our, uh, our uh, interactions with property owners. We uh, send them a link to a very standard simplified survey that talks about customer experience and satisfaction. And we have determined from those responses, we get about 20 to 25% response rate on these voluntary survey surveys, which is actually a pretty good rate. Um, and from that, we determine a net promoter score. And a net promoter score is an industry standard that's established for any industry that basically um, uh, measures the integrity of a program. 
Um, and the integrity of the program is taken from both positive and negative scores on um, questions about was the um, experience overall beneficial for you? Were, was the company responsive? Um, was the contractor timely? Um, would you recommend this to a colleague or a family member? So very simple sort of standardized uh, set of questions um, about customer experience. And, and we rate very, very high um, among financial services. You can see on the right far right is USAA, a very credible um, company. And then of course, Y Green is just, just under, falls just underneath that score. In California, we range at about 60 to 65 as a, as a unit number, probably doesn't mean anything to anybody, but just so that you know, that's a net of both the positive and negative responses we get on those data points. Uh, here's just a, a brief um, snapshot of one of the uh, many uh, property owners in Sacramento um, and the improvements that they installed um, include pool roof, HVAC, and gutters. Um, talks about what they did, and then a little quote from our, our property owner, and of course they allowed us to use the picture of their home and their quote um, in sharing this with others. Um, a lot of our customer, our, our acquisition of customers comes from customer referrals. <coughs> the majority of the customers come from the contractors being trained um, on the program and offering it when the property owner gets to a point when they say, yep, you know, I need an HVAC replace um, and I need to get new windows as well while I'm doing that to make my home more efficient. Um, how do you want to pay for this? The contractor will say, and they'll say, you know, cash, credit card, VLOC, oh, and there's this, this option called PACE. And that's how we get customers. Um, so obviously the conduit there is our contractor, and I can't emphasize enough um, how important it is that we use um, the top rated, um, most sort of, um, you know, qualified contractors for these improvements. Um, have there been contractor issues in the past? Yes. Have there been contractor issues in the home improvement market since the beginning of time? 100%. Um, what, what you make here is some sort of linkage between PACE and contractor issues, and I think I can, can confidently say that the reason for that is we allow a channel now for these complaints to actually be, um, to be um, elevated and talked about, and we have a process for recourse um, and oversight and disciplinary action on our contractors and then restitution for our customers as well in the event that that's needed. So I think that the linkage there is that, you know, now we've provided this channel because we have a very, very rigorous contractor management training and oversight department. Um, and so the good news is, is that now you're hearing about <coughs> these issues. The bad news for us is, is that they're attributed to PACE. They've been going on forever, okay? Uh, the only other way for a customer to um, complain about a contractor that's gone rogue and has done something that's not right is to uh, follow up with the CSLB, so the Contractor State License Board, or come to you all and, and uh, complain at a public meeting or through the attorney's office, etc. cetera. So, um, and those, those issues may still happen, so those complaints may still happen, but if they come through the PACE provider, so if they come through Wigrey's um, uh, customer Resolutions Department is what we call it. There's an absolute process for um, addressing those issues, for um, uh, being involved in the process between the contractor and the property owner, although that's not um, uh, prescriptively our role in our finance agreement. It sort of uh, delineates the line of responsibility between the PACE finance company and the property owner, but we still get involved because we know that the contractor network is the primary source of uh, customers for us, and we want to keep that as clean and as um, high quality as, as absolutely possible. So I'm just going to pause for a second. Um, I've come to the end of my presentation. Here's just a few more quotes from some uh, homeowners throughout the state, um, starting with a few from Butte County and Sacramento. I'll just leave that on the overhead. Um, I included in the folder, and I will email these as well, um, Tina, to you so that they're available electronically if the public wants them. Um, and I'll leave this extra folder here. But I added some materials, um, marketing materials on the right-hand side, just some handouts about the program, some communications that we provide to property owners um, in advance of their first tax bill payment so that they're not surprised. Um, and then on the left-hand side, I included um, our consumer protections uh, policy document. It's a, a sort of a playful, infographic heavy um, description of all the consumer protections that are unique to PACE. Um, and embedded in our program. And we think this is very, very helpful instead of reading our 27 page policy document that was ad adopted by our JPA board that's really um, content heavy. This um, just gives you a snapshot of all the unique uh, consumer protections uh, attributed to PACE. And then lastly, I 
<coughs> included a copy of our um, annual report provided to Golden State Finance Authority. So this captures um, uh, program activity through uh, the calendar year 2018. Um, it's a lot longer. It gives you actually a specific list of eligible measures. So now you can see what's um, already available should you decide to move forward with adoption of the program and what would be immediately available. There has been some leadership change with the executive board. I can address that um, outside of this meeting. But again, it just sort of goes uh, through the highlights of our program, um, a lot of what I've talked about today. Now, one quick correction. In the back, you'll see a list of the counties that we serve and the cities that we serve. And at the top, it says Calaveras County. Calaveras County opted out at the beginning of this year um, for reasons that um, I don't need to go into. Um, you may have heard that before. But one of the unique features of um, a program operating in a county is that any time a city or county can choose to um, terminate the program if they need to. And I think that's really important. Again, it goes back to that decision of local control um, that you all have and provide for your constituency that you know best. So I will stop there and I appreciate all your time. I think I've gone over my 10 minutes. Answer any questions? Yes. <laughs> um, I'm curious about how the program will not affect county staff. Um, how does that process occur? So we, uh, the, the staff that's most heavily impacted is initially when we discuss this with the board, so taking your time this morning to present, that's, that's one part. Um, if you were choose, to choose to adopt the program, somebody would have to write the staff report um, and go through the review of the resolutions to make sure they, they work for you all. They're a standard template, which has been proven throughout the state and other cities and counties. So that would be another um, sort of impact to county time, but it's, it's minimal. We try to keep it as simple as possible. And then the uh, county tax collector is the one that does the um, addition of the assessment um, on the tax roll each year. And they get cost recovery for that. So we have an agreement that's uh, specific to each county. They set the fee for each parcel. Um, that, so there's a mechanism there that allows for cost, full cost recovery for the county, and they determine that amount um, if you adopt the program. And so that would be the ongoing relationship. But other than that, we try to keep it as hands-free as possible. Some counties do. Um, get more involved. They want to do co-marketing. They want to promote events. They want to do more outreach. We welcome all of that. We will collaborate with you to the extent that you want. But if you just don't want to be bothered, that's that's how the program was designed because we know how taxed local cities and counties are with implementing programs that they have in place and up reaching additional goals. So we want this to be something that's turnkey and can just be plugged in and help you achieve your climate action plan goals. You know your economic development goals your fire prevention strategy, um, and uh, not make an impact to ongoing resources. Okay. Um, and then regarding the high impact fire zone, would a constituent have to wait until next year, until that's passed through, in order to apply for a fire suppression um, project, or? If the, if the uh, measure is already in our list of eligible measures, so roof replacement would allow, be allowed, there may be some other measures you'll see there that would have some other attribute of energy efficiency or water conservation. And so that would be the feature that we would be allowed to operate under, but they may have a, um, you know, additional benefit in fire prevention. So it's really up to the contractor to know the difference. It wouldn't be a fire prevention measure, but you could certainly qualify under the energy efficiency and water improvement. Um, as it would be available as of next year. We haven't quite figured out how to thread the needle with the, the qualification of these high impact fire districts through CAL FIRE. So it was a little bit of a um, blind spot when we passed the initiative, had the legislation passed last year that we're trying to navigate right now. So I'll give you more details there, but there are measures that would also help with fire prevention. They just are qualified under the water or energy savings attribute. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yes, um, regarding PACE and AB 465 that you mentioned and why green. What do you see in your future looking at that bill? There's also some disaster recovery items. Is will there will PACE be playing a larger portion of disaster recovery? Also, that it looks like there's some financing for public works or recovery of public works that have been damaged. Mm -hmm. So we only finance uh, private properties because but of the public is in that bill. Mm -hmm. It looks like mm -hmm. okay. right. So we, I can only address the the homeowner or the commercial property owner. Say. And what is what do you see your future? Is PACE looking at moving in that direction or looking at moving into, or is, is Wybring looking at moving in that direction or moving into disaster recovery? Well, um, 
if, it, if it's eligible under PACE, the PACE statute, so we don't get to decide, so we're beholden to fire prevention at this time, okay. but we certainly would be interested and have relationships in place with legislators um, to consider expanding the array of, of eligible measures, but right now we're beholden to the list that's in the back of this book um, to date. So you, you really haven't gone through the legislation and come up with <coughs> Um, right now, the only gray area is figuring out how to make this accessible through the state, like our statewide program, because we don't want to be limited to um, extremely high impact fire impact right. areas. Um, because we see that there's a need, you know, like Sonoma County, for example, wouldn't be a high fire impact area designated, uh, although we saw well, what happened two years ago. Also looking at flooding, the, the whole thing. Right. So, so right. it's really opening up a, a new area of yeah. business for you. I think so. I mean, I, I would say I probably should be promoting it more, more optimistically. Well, yes, we plan to grow in a certain I don't think you figured it out yet. Plus, it looks right. like it might be replacing eventually FEMA or something mm -hmm. like that. So, yeah, it's and scary. I, I can't speak to the disaster recovery piece. Okay. So, that's uh, it, it's more about the fire prevention, and there's a huge market for that. We're all very well familiar with right now, right? So, um, so we need to figure out that, that uh, accessibility piece to making it accessible to. Uh, fire impact okay. areas and and but yes we would love to expand the, the range of eligible measures and um, it it really comes down to the communal attribute looks like you're going to be able to go I hope so legally. okay Supervisor so, Brooks so let's go a little deeper into the, the tax collector role in this so you she collects the money or, or he um, and checks get distributed, but what happens when the person doesn't pay their taxes? So uh, it takes five years to go through the process before they have to pay or get the property sold off. Uh, you guys, you, you just are on the hook like the county is for five years? Um, as far as I know, I can't honestly speak to that um, in, in great detail, but that's the, my understanding of it. So um, I will say that the, the count, so if somebody doesn't pay, right, so they become uh, uh, delinquent on their payment, um, which can happen, that's not um, unique to PACE, it's unique to any special assessment district, you need to pay the whole bill, um, not a portion of it just tied to the property tax. And there are some cases in which a property owner will say, no, I wasn't in support of that fire district, I'm not gonna pay that statement, right? And they don't pay a small portion of it and then they, they're, you know, they're delinquent. Um, and then if it extends past the three or four month window, it becomes, you know, into the discussion around default. Usually by the time they get that second bill when they become delinquent, um, usually they will true up, if you will, and make those payments to become whole so that they're, they wouldn't fall into the, the default category. Um, I usually do not talk about default rates or delinquency rates um, in general. It's usually something I follow up with specifically with the board in this area if you wanted some comparison or even statewide, and I'm more than happy to do that. Um, so so um, let me just put it a different way. Mm -hmm. So you have no ability to put a lien on the property except through the county's tax we, we could do it. We, we could do it um, separate from the county, but the way that our program is designed and has been um, supported by our private funding, so our investors, has been the collection mechanism is through the county because it's more secure that way. So we have, do have the ability. So you to, have the ability to, to yes. put a lien in that mm -hmm. process. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next kind of question, and I don't know if it's a question or a statement. So in, in the process, and when you had that nice slide about the uh, interest rates, mm -hmm. so I still have never been clear on why this is different than a home equity loan. And in fact, it's probably a little cheaper in a home equity loan, except for that you have a better marketing plan and better service and the fact that you work with the, with the contractors and that sort of thing. Is that, is that basically the difference? Uh, yeah, and I would say that the contractor network, the oversight, the training, um, the local sales force, so that we have hired staff that works with the property owner and the contractor to help um, sort of handhold property owners through the process. It's pretty standard for most residential properties, but in some cases, that local staff person will help um, talk a property owner through a, a scope of work, get them familiarized with the local contractor, etc. Um, so I would say the contractor management oversight role is 
extremely significant um, and cannot really be understated compared to uh, what's available when a property owner just go, has money from the HELOC or credit card and has to find their own contractor. Yes, there's Angie's List. Yes, they can call the Better Business Bureau. Yes, they can go on maybe a green building website if that some of the counties throughout the state have a list of contractors that do energy efficiency improvements through those web websites. But you have to be assuming that the property owner is sort of the informed consumer and we provide that service to them. We give them all of the sort of oversight that um, the um, credential checks that are in place through our contractor training, um, you know, licensed, bonded, insured, um, <clears throat> no outstanding issues with the CSLB, good rating on Angie's list. So we sort of do that due diligence for them, which is huge. Um, the other part is the um, assurances in our disclosure documents, which is not um, unique to PACE because we follow the no before you owe sort of standard disclosure process but as well the massive amounts of program explanation and role and rights and responsibilities of the finance company, the contractor, and the property owner before somebody executes the contract. And then of course we have the three-day right to cancel, which is not unique to PACE, um, but we've had in place for um, since the beginning of our program. And then additionally, the confirmed terms call. So that's a huge part that's unique to PACE. Um, we think it's a big consumer protection. It's something that makes our program stronger. But in short, yes. Okay. Um, and the difference in the the um, rate that uh, is what pays for those additional robust uh, sort of package attributes. Fair enough. And when when somebody say contacts you and says you want a, uh, a solar array put in, uh, do you do you do analysis for them on if that actually is cost savings for the particular area? We, uh, the, as a finance company, we don't, but we do encourage um, the property owners to use the uh, the websites that are available on their local investor-owned utility or if it's a municipally-owned utility. They usually have links to like an energy rater or um, energy sage company that evaluates you know the size of your home, your geographic location, the, the pitch of your roof, that sort of thing to tell you, and your energy bill to tell you, you know, roughly what you should be looking at so there's no oversizing of the system. But the, the oversizing piece, so so we encourage property owners to pursue that before they choose a contractor or if they have a contractor to make sure the contractor goes through that process. Um, but, but when and if that doesn't occur, by the time it gets into our um, application and underwriting team, we have price controls and construction compliance oversight that checks for that. So you know we can't have a, um, a uh, 30-year term on a solar system with panels that aren't the most high efficient panels that would only go for 20 years. So that would be one control. Um, we also would look at the size of the system with the size of the home and be able to see really very quickly ballpark this is an oversized system and go back to the contractor and say, what's the story? So, okay. yeah. And lastly, more is more to comment. I, I do appreciate very much the fire prevention part of this. I think that is a huge difference than the last time saw this and it could be very high. Thank you. Sometimes it grows. We have um, treasurer Nick Breyer that might be able to answer the other question if you'd like. No, I, I, you got, I okay. got my question. Okay. So, no. Yes, okay. yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. I do have a few questions. Uh, if the county was to proceed forward, uh, I would assume that the whole county would be then the district but it would be an individual that would contact you and only the individual's uh, property tax. It would not be the whole county, correct? That's exactly right. And so, um, out of curiosity, when Calusa pulled out of the program, did they have to somehow get everybody paid off with no. you? Okay, no. so it stays on the, the, the individual's tax rules. And it was, to Calabar. clarify, it was Calabar, sorry. Yeah, and Angel's Calabar. Camp is still in the program, so they, any incorporated city is not triggered by a county action. They're all, any incorporated jurisdiction acts independent of the rest of the statewide program. Okay. And the statewide program is just that it's available through our joint powers authority statewide, should a city or, <coughs> or county opt in, excuse me. <coughs> so we have, each one of us have, have these little areas within our districts that have um, private roads, not, not maintained by the state or the feds or even our local department of transportation. Um, they don't have adequate uh, 
grades, they don't have adequate width, they're, they're uh, one way in, one way out. If a community, say of uh, multiple people, were to decide uh, to, to collectively utilize their money, could they do road improvement? Could they put in fire hydrants? Could they put in water tanks? That's a great question, and the, the real answer is I don't know. I'm hopeful that that's something we could add to the list of eligible measures. The, the piece that is required is that it has to be tied to the physical property, so that it has to be something that stays with the property. It can't be something that can be removed from the property. So in your description, the grates and the hydrants and all of that, I would imagine would be uh, not technically, but categorically affixed to the property, right? It's not something that somebody would take with them if they sold the home or the property. And that's really the piece because it has to be tied to the, uh, affixed to the property. Um, right now, um, you know, technically speaking, those aren't affixed to the property, so it would be some um, creative um, underwriting, I think, that would go, go with that property in particular, and it'd probably be a commercial um, collective agreement. So the answer is I hope so. I don't have the clear yes that now because I haven't heard property where we've done that but I think it's possible Thank you, it just has to be something that we can tie the um, assessment to the actual property itself the parcel itself that's all the questions I have. thank you thank you um, just a couple I, I remember when this got started mm -hmm. not with your company but Sonoma County kind of led the way on this concept um, <coughs> at the time when the recession was hitting in 09 and they were looking for keeping their contractors working, just growing up uh, energy efficient windows, keep some of that small projects going, including um, with the goal of some energy efficiency. So it's, it's interesting to see how it's grown in, in 10 years. Um, kind of taking off a question Supervisor Groves asked uh, in terms of why would they go with you versus a uh, home equity loan um, or credit card. Um, just from rumblings on the street when people have been applying for their home equity loan, it seems like that takes a long time, where your financing uh, can take not as long to, to get rolling. Is that a That's true. true? Yeah, okay. there's a quicker turnaround for approval or denial or a, um, you know, a temporary sort of um, review of the application. Yeah, generally speaking, it's a lot quicker turnaround. Um, with the addition of the ability to pay underwriting requirements, that slows things down a bit, but again, we think that that's you know, part of the overall push towards additional consumer protection. Um, but generally speaking, it's much quicker. Okay. Uh, that was it. Any other wrap up, everyone? No? Great. Thank you for the presentation, Jeremy. Thank you. And if there's any if there's any consideration of bringing the program forward for adoption by Trinity County, like I said, that can be done through simple passing of resolutions, which um, we have templates for and staff reports as well. We also have that for the tax collection agreement um, for this particular county. So thank you so much for your time. Great. Is there any other questions from the audience? Yes. So we're borrowing money from you, and we're paying the county back, correct? Um, you're taking money from the equity in the property of your own property right. and right. paying us back through the county's tax collection right. process. So it's a, it's an annual lump sum that we have to pay? Correct, unless you add money to your impound account, which is what a lot of the property owners do. And we put that in the finance agreement, so it's an option for people to think about because this is a unique way to pay something back and a lot of times as consumers we're used to paying monthly for most of the other things that we um, finance and so it's a it's a way to sort of protect the consumer from being surprised once okay. Thank, you. thank you thank you again Emily thank you is that it for yes yeah okay you can talk to her offline I'm sure she'll ask well, that doesn't help you guys in those All right, we will take a few minute break before our 10 o'clock public hearing.
number one, adopt the mitigated deck. deck. Um, that's finding that on the basis of the whole record before the board, including the CEQA initial study and comments received, that there is no substantial evidence that the project will have significant effect on the environment. We had a mitigated neck deck reflects the board's independent judgment and analysis. Number two, introduce waiver reading of an enacted ordinance amending the Trinity County Zone, zoning ordinance number 315 by rezoning APN 017 dash or 30-49 from agriculture 10 acre minimum lot side to specific unit development. And three, adopt a resolution which approves a conditional use permit for cannabis manufacturing, distribution, and nursery based on the findings of fact and subject to conditions of approval on the attached board resolution. Planning Commission recommendation of approval. <coughs> okay. Yes, I am. You are. Uh, Chair, I will be recusing myself from this item. Okay. Thank you very much. Do you have to have yes, I do. Thank you. Anyway, all right. Good morning, Leslie. Good morning, Supervisors. So this project proposes to rezone a 30-acre parcel from an ag 10-acre minimum to SUD. And the SUD, the reason that an SUD, specific unit development, is proposed is because that is a special zoning district that combines a unique set of activities that are applicable for this site. Um, there was a CEQA document, I have a copy of it right here, that was done for the project. It is a mitigated negative declaration. <laughs> And the, pro the mitigated neg deck also included, well, it included the rezone, manufacturing, distribution, nursery, and impacts that would be associated with an increased cultivation site if the applicant has the opportunity to do that in the future. Um, there were comments that were received at the planning commission level from two agencies, from Fish and Wildlife and from the Forest Service. The Forest Service says, please do not use water from Forest Service lands. There's no permit that allows them to do so and the applicant is not proposing to use water from Forest Service lands. And the other questions and comments that Fish and Wildlife had were related to the groundwater wells connectivity to Hayport Creek. Uh, the applicant for this project retained his own consultant who did prepare this environmental document. Uh, Base Camp Environmental would be available by phone if we needed to ask them specific questions regarding the CEQA document. And the applicant is here today as well to field questions. But in response to Fish and Wildlife's questions, the consultant retained a professional geologist who did a more intensive analysis of whether or not this well is connected to Hayport Creek and determined that it is not. And there is a letter that's provided in the materials for, that you have today with the board item um, that is from that professional geologist that gives that um, result. Um, we also received a couple of questions regarding uh, fire and whether there is support from the local fire department regarding this and we do have a letter of support that was signed by Tim Spears he is the chief of the Hayport volunteer fire department I have copies of that letter as well uh, the Planning Commission heard this item earlier this summer it was introduced in one meeting and continued to another so that commissioners could take a longer look at the CEQA document because it's fairly significant in size and then they uh, brought the item back on July 11th and approved it. So do you have any questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, there was, a, first off, I, I do have a comment on, on future packets. Uh, could, could we have written notes of the Planning Commission because the Planning Commission meeting took me over three hours to watch on my Ten five seconds on, ten seconds down. Uh, so it was very difficult to answer. But 
with that said, the there was discussion at the planning commission about why not industrial versus the SUV. You know, could you just give a, a brief why the staff thinks it's uh, better to be SUV than industrial? Uh, well, in part, currently our cultivation licensing requires that a residence be on site for cultivation, and this applicant really began his whole cannabis business <coughs> with cultivation. And so there is a residence on, that is on site. Um, the SUD combines the uses of ag, industrial, and residential. Um, so that is right. Although they're separated by quite a distance. approved all three numbers. Correct. I see it listed under number three, but I want to make sure that applied to number one and two as well. Correct. Yeah, okay. Just to make sure. Oh. Yes. All right. Four to one. Okay. May I also speak to the industrial Hold it. You'll, have, anything? you'll have a moment. Um, all right. Any other technical questions from the board for staff before I open it up? Okay, will the applicant, does the applicant have questions, comments? Oh, sure, yeah. Good morning, I'm Dan Boudian from Hayfork. Um, I'd like to say thanks to all the county staff involved in getting the project to this point today, and a special thank you to the Board of Supervisors for providing a platform for a project like this to exist through the establishing of the various ordinances that relate to this scope of work. I've diligently worked to do everything above board as soon as I was afforded the opportunity to do so by the county. This is reflected in my cultivation license number of five. I appreciate the opportunity to bring a project like this to the board and establish a first-of-its-kind facility for Trinity County's budding cannabis industry. As a longtime county resident, I recognize the need to provide not only the manufacturing and distribution services to my community, as there are currently none actively operating here in the county, but there's also a dire need for employment here. Uh, my parents came to the States in the early 80s as political refugees from one of the most oppressed parts of the world. And uh, in one generation, to be able to build a business like this, to me, is the definition of the American dream, and I'm happy to be doing it here in Trinity County. Um, I spent the last year doing an extensive environmental analysis on all the proposed activities as they relate to this project. And the design of the facility is state-of-the-art, Considerations for the safety of our employees in the community was held at the forefront of the CEQA analysis process. And again, we're looking forward to growing this business into the future here. I've got extensive knowledge regarding the hydrocarbon extraction process and would be happy to field any questions about that or any of the other facets of this project for you today. Thank you. I'd also like to highlight the fact that when I brought this project to planning, I initially requested to rezone the property to industrial. Um, over the year that this project took to kind of take shape, we identified the SUD zoning as a better uh, approach to creating this project site because if I was to rezone the property industrial and say I, I successfully operated the business for 30 years, then it went into probate, and it got sold, and it was zoned industrial. Someone at the end of that road would have many uses by right written into the uh, allowed uses of that APN number by zoning it industrial that don't necessarily fit the character of the property. And so I was advised by my consultant after he <coughs> Uh, check the county zoning, zoning ordinance as well as county staff to take the SUD route. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments from the public on this item? Hello, my name is Matt Swanstrom. I have a licensed farm in Hayfork, and I'm just here today to voice my support for the uh, LA planning project. Thank you for your time.
Hi, my name is Michael Cardulo. I own a licensed farm in Hayfork. It would be really beneficial for us to have this project approved. It's very hard working with distribution and manufacturing out of county. Nobody really wants to come to Hayfork to pick product up and take it. Um, it's so much easier for them to get stuff out of there. Yeah. So thank you guys. Okay, I agree with that. Of particular yeah. concern? Uh, there were questions regarding the use of Morgan Hill Road, uh -huh. and uh, given, like the applicant Dan just said, the idea that that parcel could be permanently rezoned to industrial would, by right, allow activities that would likely generate more traffic. And so that was a concern, but as for the traffic impacts of the project as proposed, um, trip generation models don't really have a cannabis manufacturing facility. You know, you have to, you just can't find that. So, um, using the best similar uses, um, the consultant in preparing the CEQA document for this project estimated that the LOS, the level of service, would not drop below level D, which is what the threshold is in our regional transportation plan for being an acceptable level of uh, performance for that road. Um, they did a little bit of a BMT, vehicle models traveled analysis as well, and it was somewhat inconclusive. You know, there were a couple different ways to argue that. One was, well, if this is a local manufacturing facility, it will, and distribution and nursery, uh, the people that would perhaps leave Hayfork Valley would instead be staying there and traveling fewer miles, and so maybe the vehicle miles traveled would be less. Although, you know, would you just take a, a snapshot of that pick of that parcel, vehicle miles traveled will be greater to the parcel, perhaps. So even so, the level of service on Morgan Hill Road did not go over an acceptable threshold. Okay. Thank you. The, uh, the fire chief's letter you yeah. have. declaration finding that on the basis of the whole record before the board, including the CEQA initial study and comments received, that there is no substantial evidence that their project will have a significant effect on the environment and that the mitigated negative declaration reflects the board's independent judgment and analysis. I'll second. Okay. Tina, please pull the board. Supervisor Brooks? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Aye. Supervisor Brown? Aye. Supervisor Moore? Motion. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion on Planning and Zoning 3.1, Paragraph 2, to introduce and waive the reading of the 
and enact an ordinance amending Trinity County Zoning Ordinance Number 315 by rezoning APN 017-430-49 from agricultural 10-acre minimum lot size to specific unit development and that's where I have to stop. <laughs> I'll second, but I do have comment. All right. Um, further discussion? Yeah, I want to uh, thank staff and the applicant for coming up with a creative SUV idea. Um, uh, even though that in the future this possibly could be detrimental to the, to the applicant's value of the property, uh, he chose to uh, do something that he felt was more desirable for his community. So I want to thank everybody involved for that. Great. All right, please pull the board. Aye. 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 Yes. Thank you. Madam Chair, I would also like to um, make a motion to approve item 3.1, the last paragraph 3, adopt a resolution which approves a conditional use permit for cannabis manufacturing, distribution, and nursery based on the finding of the fact and subject to conditions of approval on the attached board resolution. Second. All right, any further discussion? Please pull the board. Supervisor Grove? Aye. Supervisor Tower? Aye. Supervisor Brown? Aye. Supervisor Moore? Yes. All right, thank you. And I know it's taken a long time, but you guys got through it. Thank you for your patience and, and good uh, staff report to listen. Okay, we can, uh, someone want to call Supervisor Fenley in?
attendants do in your visa, like what notes and about the resolution for that report. The others include one protest that we received from solid, by Solid Waste and the emails attached and a list of payments that were received right after our payment deadline, which we're asking for permission to deposit. <coughs> I was hoping you would take a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> Things run smooth when you're out of the bathroom. That's why you should have taken a lot longer. Okay, sorry for the delay in my item. I don't have to jump, so this is, this is causing me trouble. Okay, so um, the matter before us is to address these one or two letters. Protest. There's one protest letter, okay, and then a list that my staff is holding checks and payments that we'd like to deposit that would affect the bottom line of the report. Okay, so would you like to take the letter of protest first? Uh, if you would like to do something, please. Did you get something to do? Can, can I ask a question? Sure, sure. Um, on the delinquent list, um, have a section. Oh my god, this list is long. There are three sections to the list. Yeah, so <laughs> we, we have you go down, down by book, and then we come to book 080, which is very low on the list, or down on the list. And I can't find any book 080. That is unsecureds that we've added in. They're not only for us in schools. So hopefully a school is not a seven thousand dollars. All right, so there's no way of knowing where that's at or <laughs> through this program. Uh, these are we've applied all the payments that we received and then this list was running yeah. in time for the deadline right with the agenda. Thank you, that's my question. <laughs> All right, so um, let's go with the letter of protest. And let me get that there. I can bring it up. All right, do you want to run us through this one? There's increasing lags in how the public can guess that their payments are going to reach the office by how the post office processes things. There's delays that have been added in that don't necessarily jive with how our deadlines were. This payment in question was received postmarked July 5th when the deadline was technically June 30th, but it was a July one, but we didn't receive the payment until the not, which was way past the deadline for our processing. And it's hard to guess what happens with the post office. They've, um, the gentleman that started a claim with the post office, so they gave him additional information saying that what their processing times are, which makes it be where, yes, that's logical that it could have happened that way and he could have mailed it on time, but there's no way that we can do that. So you are denying? As, as a standard, mm -hmm. yes, it's outside of our deadline and what our processing times were. And the board, board can uh, go with that or make another decision. Yes. yes. Okay. Question? Sorry, John. Yes. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so, Diane, Gerald, this is Gerald, correct? Yes. He actually, he, ha he has, um, is there any proof that he has gone to the post office and filed a claim? There's a, an additional letter, the email that he sent me that has right. the claim number on it. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Supervisor Yeah, I appreciate this um, conversation, not specifically about this gentleman, um, but the greater conversation once we deal with the delinquency is, um, and I spoke with Diane and Super, or Dr. Coons yesterday, I believe that we need to address this because this is the second time I'm aware that it's happened in three years that because of the mail and um, it's actually in the backup, it's, they, the processing in Sacramento they're claiming can take up to eight days. And so um, 
once this is resolved, Madam Chair, I'd like to suggest that perhaps we have a uh, committee headed by Diane to figure out a conversation in the future regarding the postal delays. Thank you. Uh, did you have a question? Mm -hmm. All right, any other comments on this? I'm not sure how this plays into the fact John Parks, I'm delinquent on my payment and I wanted to resolve this and it says I can't pay and that you guys are having a meeting today. Okay, so, so I want to pay and be done. You wouldn't mind just holding while we finish this portion sure. of the item and then we'll get you. Okay, board members, anyone else would like to speak to this specific item for the public? Hi, my name is Barbara Robowitz, and I came and... Uh, we're still dealing with this first item, and then we will... Oh, okay, sorry. Item as well. Yep, same yeah. situation. Okay, anyone else on this item? All right, back to the board. Um, how would you like to proceed on this protest on the mail situation? Madam Chair, would you entertain um, a reduced late fee? Sure, what would that... What specifically are you looking for? I would look for advice from the whole board okay. if they're comfortable with. Diane, what would, what is the typical? I'm willing to make a motion to uh, let the to have no fee, have the fee go away. I'll second that. All right. To the care of that. I'm sorry. Thirty-five. Dollars. That's what I thought. Okay. Uh, board members, we have a motion to second. Any further discussion? No? Okay. Um, I don't believe we need a resolution on, I mean, a poll on the board. No. So, um, the motion is second to remove the late fee. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right, so moved. Okay, now we will go to the individuals who have uh, a, a late fee issue. You can at least step forward. Yeah, John Parks, I don't even have a late fee issue. I just want to pay the bill. Oh, okay. Um, so, Diane, can he take care of this with you, or will he still encounter the late fee? Since I have the one list, uh -huh. we could probably revise that one and add it to that list. Those need to still be deposited. Okay. So, um, what would he, should he just stick around when we get to that list? I've, yeah. got, I've got further appointments. I need to deal with fire marshal and city of Reading on a project. So it's just something that we can do. If you want to leave the payment with me and we can mail you a receipt for it, no that problem. would work for you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank and, you. And you're on the record. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you, sir. That's very good. It might be late. <laughs> gotcha. Are you in the same boat as this gentleman? You just like to make a payment or no? Pardon? Never mind. No, I'm here because I went in about five times to try to pay this because I'm low income. I filled out the blue paper, brought it in. They wanted this. I brought it to them. That wasn't good enough. They wanted something else. I brought it to them. I brought my bank statement. When I got it at the end of the month, they said it was too late. They charged me, they wanted to charge me the $100 plus $35 late charge. I told them I, I wasn't going to pay that and I walked out. Then I got this pig notice in the mail and that's why I'm here. Okay. So, Diane, am I safe to assume that this would be on the list as well, technically? It's, um, I am not aware of what the activity was on it before June 30. Okay. I would have to look into that to accept the, the reduced fee on it. Okay, so... Could you please repeat your name for the board? Barbara Bellwitz. Okay. So, um, I'm going to put you in a holding pattern still, Barbara, so bear with me while we go to that list of the regular... So, don't leave, but have a seat. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So happy. So, 
moving on to the list, which I think will take care of this item. Let me just bring that list up. $9,585 that is on <coughs> pages 88 and 89, it looks like, yes, the last two pages of the delinquent list. These are payments that were received in the office after the time where we would have time to process them for having them on the agenda. If we had stopped to do the actual processing, it would have delayed all of the deadlines that we had to get this item to the board. So we are now holding these payments, and we either can send them back or we can deposit them within our time frame for depositing payments. And by judging by the list, it looks like these folks did include their late payment. Yes, these were ones that would take absolutely no other follow-up other than writing the deposit and then putting it in the system. Okay. Board members, any other questions on this? So really, you would just need to know to accept them or not. Yes. Okay. With an additional $135. Are you going to go to the public person? Any other comments from the public on this item? All right, seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we um, allow or accept these payments and um, authorize Diane to deposit them. Second. All right, any other further discussion? So Diane, in terms of this uh, woman here in the audience, should she be included, or is this a separate item that we need to deal with? It needs to be dealt with separately. Okay. After we look into it to see what exactly the whole history was. Okay. So I just didn't want to make sure we approved a motion and then we have to go back. All right. Yeah. Um, it'll stay if we go through just how it is now, then it'll be on the delinquent list. But I can also bring back a subsequent item to adjust the list. Okay. When we figure out what it is. Okay. Just want to make sure we weren't creating more problems for you. All right, board members, I have a motion to second. All in favor to accept these payments? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, so moved. So, in terms of this last item, uh, should she just meet with you after the meeting and you can research the item for her? If I if I could get contact information, then I can go back and check in the office and give you a call and work out once I look into it and see what's going on with it. All right. Give us a chance. Well, I just, uh, we had a discussion earlier about what we can do to help the dumps be cleaner and, and that. And I think the first thing was should pay their two hundred twenty thousand dollars in doing mm -hmm. so I, I think those two do correlate. <laughs> True. Yeah. So. Thank you for pointing that out. All right. So the, I, you are all. I do have the resolution. resolution. Yeah. Thank you. Are you ready to? Um, <coughs> please. Thank you. I'll make a motion that we um, pass the resolution number. Uh, of the Board of Supervisors on the County Attorney confirming the 2019 and 2020 delinquent list regarding the solid waste parcel fee. I'll second. All right. Any further discussion?
All right, moving back to consent calendar, these items include routine on controversial matters that will be acted upon the board by a one roll call motion. A member of the board, staff, or public may request an item be full considered uh, separately. Board members, any particular items? 2.14. All right. Any member of the public wishing to pull an item? 2.2. 2. 2. 2. 2. Okay. Yeah, we'll just see here. Thank you. All right. For the remainder, the motion for the remainder of the calendar. Sorry. Sorry. August 6th, the special meeting minutes of August 7th, as submitted by the deputy clerk, no fiscal impact. Kate Graves from Lewiston. Um, way back when um, Representative Huffman was here, I gave the board a letter and asked them that it be put in the record, and it wasn't. So the next meeting, I gave you 10 copies and a cover sheet showing that I had given it to you before, and it's still not in there. So, so. At the last meeting, I'd ask both council and CAO to look into it because there's some technical issues around it. I don't have those, so they can maybe describe it today or offline. With, okay. Where the board's pleasure is. Um, then let's let's hear if you're prepared. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, the CAO and I did have an opportunity to talk with the clerk's office regarding the process. Because we only do action items, we cannot attach a document to the minutes. Uh, to do so would go beyond what an action item is, which is just the votes and um, the yay or nay. Uh, it doesn't list the specific discussion of what was done. So what the board, uh, what the clerk uh, has done to make sure that it's publicly posted is any documents that are received uh, during a board meeting are attached to the agenda, but they're not attached uh, or uh, as part of the agenda. They're attached as a supplement with a very clear uh, designation that these documents were received during the meeting. So there's no confusion that they were submitted prior. They're very clearly identified as being submitted during the meeting. Um, and that way, those documents become part of the record. Um, they're actually easier to search that way, so that if somebody's looking in the future to see what was part of that packet or what the board considered in making their decision, um, they would have uh, easy access to it. They would not if it was attached to the minute, nor is allowed because we're doing action item. Okay. Sounds good. I have a question. Um, thank you. Uh, that was a presentation. I don't remember, recall, I guess, I'm, I'm a, it was not under consent, it was a present, presentation. So it's a question because there was no action taken on that? Yeah. And I, when I say action item only, I, I, what that is is a, a, a concept versus whether you have made it verbatim minutes or whether you only put action in there. Um, and so even if it's just a presentation, it would just say presentation help versus saying, uh, Huffman spoke, and these people from the audience spoke, and this was what was said. Um, we don't do it that way. Some jurisdictions do, uh, but it's found to be inefficient and a waste of time, especially since we have the video cameras now that actually keep a better record than humans can. Um, so, it, so in all items, we don't attach anything to the minutes other than the specific any action items. Everything else is not included. Right. So we're. Where does one find the supplemental, like on our website, where do we find the supplemental? It's my understanding, um, and excuse me here, it's my understanding that if you go to the agenda item and you click on it uh, after the meeting, the agenda item will have it attached, but it will be on the end of it, and it will have a uh, page break that says item submitted during the meeting. Is that is that correct? Okay. And that has not happened on the last two. And I also disagree with county council just advised you. Well, she's our council, so. And it's at the board's pleasure to follow it. So I'm just reminding you of that also. So, so the, it should the, be there next time, I assume. It should so be there now. I believe I just got an indication from the clerk that it is there. It should be there. Yes, it should she be there. Check. So she's checking, so thank you. Okay. It's also my pleasure to follow. Council at this point. 
Okay, supervisor Groves and pretty fine that let us go to them. Um, item 2.14, adopt the project construction plan specific specifications for the highway safety improvement program signage project number three. Authorize the director of transportation to make revisions as necessary and authorize staff to advertise for bid subject to routing and form. No impact to the general fund, 332,000 from highway safety, safety improvement program grant funds and 33,200 from road fund. All right, what was your question? Well, I'd like a little better explanation than what I had in the packet. Maybe it was there and I just was tired of going to the planning commission <laughs> information for hours. Um, but on face value, we have 30 curves of signage for $330,000. So what, what exactly is this, what does this program do? Well, the Highway Safety Improvement Program is meant to, it's with the intent of reducing accidents. And what we do is we go out and identify High lo locations of high collisions or potential. Um, in Trinity County, we don't have a, a lot of, we have a very high accident rate, but we don't have a high uh, count of people that have accidents. So, what you do is you don't have that location that you can specifically go out and fix. Instead, you have to take a systemic approach to it and fix all the curves along a certain corridor. And so, we selected a couple corridors that had a higher than the usual accident rate, and we went out and uh, drove it, evaluated through ball bank survey, and through observations of locations that would uh, garment or uh, suggest that we put up chevrons and, and uh, uh, better signage to uh, improve um, the driving experience so that you get run off the road. So is that driving around part of this cost? Oh yeah, well no, it's, it was uh, part of the initial cost of the grant. And so uh, that was uh, that was done as, um, there was three reports that were done. Those were finished about a year and a half ago. I, I guess what I'm getting at is if we have 30 curves, so 60 signs, and 60 signs cost $332,000. Well, it's, it's I mean, is there more? It, it, no, there's, it, we're talking, this is, uh, this is object markers, um, Chevron signs, and curb warning signs, and some looks at some, there's a little bit of some striping modifications. And so those plus mobilization costs is what really uh, drives the cost of the overall project. So, you know, actually coming out of Reading to come up here, uh, their day starts in Reading, it doesn't start here. So we have to, uh, or you know, wherever the contract comes from, uh, that gets, and it ends up getting absorbed into the cost, and that's why we usually have a little bit higher cost than what would be expected to see in Sacramento. But this is, this is a consistent, their estimate is consistent with what other projects have been estimated at, and um, so I, I feel good about the estimate, and it's probably what it's going to end up costing. All right, ten thousand dollars a curve. It is. Okay. All right. And any other comments or no, questions on this item? Well, Sure. Um, I, I kind of have a problem with you telling us that, and, and don't take this too personally, that uh, there's more accidents out there, but you don't have any of the hard data to back it up. I want, so, you know, you might want to let us know that there's hard data or not hard data. Well, one of the problems with Trinity County is, is that I understand. people we've have had this accidents. And, uh, Rick, we've had this discussion, but you're making a statement saying that this is necessary, but you don't have the data to spend the money or back it up. So we have the data in accident rates, okay, not in accident numbers. 
Yes. The, the rate, the rate my um, in Marin County, the rate of having an accident is uh, 0.5 accidents for every 100 million miles traveled. And that's a serious injury or fatal accident. In Trinity County, it's about 12 accidents. So it's considerably higher. I can only speak for the Hayfork side. A lot of people have accidents and they just take their vehicle and go away. It's not you called in um, the time lapse between, unless it's a uh, where there's an emergency where the EMS shows up. I, you know, you you can see the stuff left on the road from the accident, and you don't know who it was unless gossip tells you. So I I understand what Rick is saying. We have notorious bad curves. And um, there are a lot more accidents that get reported than get reported. I agree with that. All right. Any other comments on this question? I am or from the public? No? All right. Um, I would entertain a motion. Motion to approve as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? All right. So moved. And or we do need to, Madam Chair, I'm sorry, yep. did we um, did we complete an um, approve 2.2? I'm just going back to that okay, as I'm about to form all of you. So we do need to approve item 2.2. And, and Madam Chair, just to recall that you asked me to look and uh, public comment documents received after the agenda is on the website. I opened up and the screen's letter is there. So okay. uh, Deputy Clerk was correct. She has done that. All right, thank you both very much. With that, I would entertain a motion for 2.2. So made. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. All right, moving on to reports and announcements. Uh, I, I do want to announce um, and thank Aaron done from Assemblymember Wood's office. I forgot to highlight you earlier, so thank you for coming over and joining us this morning. Can I see something? Yes. Yeah. Um, you passed the message on to Senator McGuire. Um, thank you for helping with the Frontier phone service issue that we experienced in District 4. Um, it was very well played out. Excellent. I will pass that on. Thank you, thank you again. <coughs> All right, reports from department heads. Good morning, uh, Shelly Nelson, HR Director. Um, I just had a couple of announcements that I wanted to share with um, all of you. Um, come September 9th through October 4th, the county will have open enrollment for health benefits for the employees. So uh, we are sending out announcements, um, describing all of those details for you. So please watch for that. And then we will be having our annual health fair. This is open to our county employees. I would like to invite each and every one of you to attend as well. It will be September 25th at the Veterans Hall from 10 to 2. And we have several of our vendors uh, attending that uh, provide all of our different uh, health benefit services. Uh, public Health will be attending, the Trinity County Hospital will be there as well. Um, you know, very excited about it. I think it's a fabulous time for employees to have interaction with these agencies and our members. Great. Thank you for highlighting that. Any other department head? let you know that with the new property tax system that we have gone live with one of our tax rules so far. We sent out our unsecure bills um, with that. So it's been a, been a little bit of some growing pains, but the, as we expected, and so we're hoping that we'll be live with the other tax rules soon. And then after that, um, TOT module will take place after that. So we're moving forward with that. And then also wanted to make you aware, I anticipate within the next two to three weeks that we will be returning to hours. So Aware of that, and then um, I thought I'd share a little bit about the um, postage. The postage uh, with our, our mail has been rerouted for for years now, and just what we do um, 
is we make everyone aware that if you go into the post office and they actually can stamp it, and because we honor postmarks as well, and I know that this all the way says too, and they make them aware of that. But that's something that's it's not something new. It's been a um, that's been a long-standing thing. So, and most online bill services make you aware that if you're paying online, that um, please be aware because they send them in groups. So you may pay it on the first, but they may not even send the checks out till the night. So, and they'll be dated later. So, just thought I would share. Thank you. I can confirm the unsecured tax bills came out. <laughs> <laughs> the check's on the way, but. All right. <laughs> All right, any other department head? All right, moving on to report from CAO. That's a good report. I have something for you. Yes. Um, and this is going to take a little bit of research, but uh, 15 years ago, we the county <laughs> did some, all of you would remember the addressing issue when we went to readdress various addresses throughout the county. Um, I don't know about other districts, but it's um, still an issue. Uh, specifically, if you're trying to order things, I'm told, and sometimes the post office will take it, but they won't. Sometimes they will or will not take FedEx boxes versus coming to your home because of this addressing issue it's it's I won't I can't use what it is it's a mess um, my understanding if I remember correctly it may not have gotten completely finished so it's something we probably should look into to see where we're at and where the problems are I realize it's not an overnight issue but I, I um, I've heard it a few times lately, and I was reminded that maybe the project didn't get finished, but I can't totally confirm that. All right, thank you so much. Any other questions for CAO? No? Okay. Moving on to reports from uh, members of the board of supervisors. Supervisor Brown? Let's see. No out of county travel. Um, I attended the collaborative meeting last week. Um, of interest was the update on the mountaintop cameras. Uh, sounds like there's still hope of that um, happening here. Um, also, I wanted to thank Sheriff Saxon for assisting with the Frontier phone service issue. The phones were out in District 4 for, I think it was two to three days before I was told about it from a constituent, and um, after uh, speaking with Saxon, he reached out to McGuire's office, and I think within two to three hours, the phones were back online. Um, and you know, strictly a safety issue, being all the code reds coming through the phones down there, cell service doesn't work down there, um, it's a big deal. So, uh, thanks to Sheriff Saxon and McGuire's office. Um, I was unable to attend the RCRC meeting. Um, Supervisor Chadwick was able to do that, and I believe she's going to share any pertinent information from that meeting. Um, the RCRC gift basket um, collection is still going on, so subtle reminder to Thank bring you. something from some districts, um, and I'll, I'll try to send up an itemized list of what we've already received um, and encourage that. Um, Thank you to the Visitor Center and Kay for reaching out um, for that boat trip. Uh, it's much appreciated. And um, that's it. All right, great. Supervisor Bill. No out of county travel. Supervisor Graves. No out of county travel, but I do want to remind everybody that the OES did the code red on August 14th, and this time mine worked. So if it didn't work for people, contact and at OES and see why. See, you know why yours worked? It didn't work last time, but they know your phone number. <laughs> or somebody specifically put it in. Might work too, yay. Well, then I will say I got a text, and I got my home phone, my business phone, yeah. uh, this yeah. phone, and right. so they got You're the service. Important. You were covered. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, and uh, I have not reported out for a, a, a moment because uh, last time I you allowed me to report specifically on the one, so uh, bear with me. NACO um, was July 7th, uh, uh, or 11th, through the 15th in Clark County, Nevada. 
Um, there's the installation of a new president, and she's from Douglas County, Nebraska. The first vice president is Gary Moore from Boone County, Kentucky. And now we have a uh, the second vice president, and uh, Larry Johnson. Um, there were a lot of incredible um, different things that happened. I would encourage everybody to go on the NACO, NACO, National Association of Counties website and you can really see a lot of things. I wanted to talk specifically, this is not my alley at all, I think um, Supervisor Finley would probably uh, be able to address it better, but it's called a Test It. It's an app you can get on your Android and your um, iPhone and iPads and it's to help uh, better um, mapping techniques NACO and CSAC uh, work together hand in hand to come up with this. It doesn't download any of your private information, but if you're somewhere that um, you run the Test It app and it has no connectivity, then the next time you have connectivity, it'll map where you were and you can actually track in real time where um, how fast your internet is working. And they're using that to have a better map um, to understand, especially rural counties. Another uh, takeaway um, tool for individuals as well as uh, um, department head is called the County Explorer. It, you go on NACO and it's a tool that provides easy access to data and it offers a snapshot of a variety of topics relative, relevant to our counties and it's a nationwide. So, so you go on it and you'll click um, Trinity County and then you'll get a lot of specific data. Um, one of the things that I would like to encourage um, the board and CAO and whoever um, is county branding. Uh, they made this a big deal. Uh, the county, Nevada State has a county-wide outdoor branding and it's brought in a lot of revenue and so I would like to see that happen in California especially with us being so re uh, recreational. On the 24th, um, we, uh, Trinity County, part of the Tri-County um, uh, group of CAP, uh, Community Action Partnership with Glenn and Calusa, we hosted at the Indian Creek Lodge. Trinity County wasn't able to do this last year because of the fire. Um, we had a vacancy. Uh, it has been filled by Sherry White on our HRN. Uh, Indian Creek Lodge did a fantastic job providing uh, lunch for that. We also hosted the uh, continuum of care that day. On July 25th, the Trinity County Fire Safe Council uh, locally. Uh, on that note, I just want to say that the Trinity County um, uh, Fire Safe, there's two grants that uh, were awarded. The Watershed Research Training was awarded $88,790 with a match of $89,440. The Trinity County Resource Conservation District, it, which uh, does the countywide CWPP, and that's the Community Wild Protection Plan um, for Fuel Reduction and FireWise Education, was awarded $178,860 with a match of $185,000. And $185,031, excuse me. So that was a pretty big deal. On uh, July 31st, the Northwest California Resource Conservation Council in uh, Crescent City, Del Norte County. Um, the 5C program and project update by Mark Lancaster. I've, I've asked him to come and do a brief presentation on what we are achieving with reducing our carbon imprint. The Cal NorCal EMS new medical director is Dr. Jeffrey Capel, and I'm not sure if I'm saying it right. And our new EMS specialist, we all know, Sean Corey, um, has taken that um, August uh, 14th. Our Supervisor Chadwick, does that mean Sean's left our Trinity Lake support? Um, technically, no, and okay. he's going to the fire chief councils. It's just that now he's on the NorCal EMS board oh, oh, as well. Oh, no. And so um, on August 14th in Sacramento, RCRC, um, Monterey County has now become a member of the Rural County um, Association. 
Um, there are a lot of takeaways. Again, the RCRC, uh, you can go and, and pull this up. One of the major things going on in our rural counties is our juvenile hall, and they had a uh, survey. We passed that forward to um, probation officer Tim, and he is, uh, Rogers, excuse me, is filling that survey out on behalf of Trinity County. On August 15th was uh, the Superior California Economic Development in Reading. We have two openings. Um, I, I did suggest one name, but we, we, um, we have one person who's been involved um, for a very long time who is contemplating removing himself. So I think we have filled one, but we might need two more, and that's um, Bill Hinman, uh, John Hinman, so you know. Bill's considering retiring. And then on August 17th, Saturday, um, I was able to participate in the local Hmong event. Um, Trinity County has now um, an elected Hmong president for their community, and they're establishing uh, Hmong leadership. In part, this has um, been timely facilitated by the Asian store raid. So that concludes my report. Okay, thank you. Um, Let's see, uh, attended, uh, not in person, but by phone, for, uh, Governor's Force uh, Management Task Force. Um, also attended the fair, which had been, it's been a couple years. It was uh, great. I, I'm so sorry I didn't encourage the board to donate to their auction for Thursday night, so hopefully that will fly off our radar for next year. We can help uh, with that event that happens on Thursday nights over there. And lastly, attended uh, a meeting um, with a variety of groups who are concerned in trying to, uh, this has come up in our collaborative for many, many years on the illegal grows on public lands. So uh, there's some effort to try and increase some funding. It's certainly a long haul to do that, but there is more and more uh, high level discussions uh, with some I think actually can maybe get it done to help with that aspect of um, public lands. Uh, with that, that is my board report. Um, moving on to the commercial cannabis ordinance amendments for ad hoc committees. Supervisor Groves? Nothing, we're still in the holding pattern. Yep. Um, we're, we're still having a couple more things to do, but we really are, like you said, in a holding pattern until our EIR is complete. Um, I will remind the board, uh, it's tentatively penciled in that we will be doing an ad hoc, ad hoc a workshop on the EIR in September. Um, as well, will the Planning Commission, from what I've been told. So, um, moving on to federal lands legislation, ad hoc committee. Nothing new. Okay. Retail cannabis. Same as last time. All right. Moving on to county matters, these items include non-routine or controversial matters that are listed alphabetically by department. A member of the board or staff may request that an item be heard out of order. We only have one item, 5.1 under human resources, approve the job description salary range, add to the department position listing one substance abuse disorder program manager at range M223, effective August 20th. 2019 and allocate to the behavioral health department alcohol and other drug division approximate cost of salary and benefits per month for a substance use disorders program manager at a step is seven thousand eight hundred twenty three dollars good morning Shelley. good morning thank you so the substance use disorders program in the department has actually been without a direct manager for the last year uh, this was formally these these duties were assumed by assistant directors that had retired. Um, this position, uh, the department head and I have been working together. It is necessary now to develop a new position here. Um, it's to provide staff supervision, training, treatment planning, development of substance use programs, organize and oversee the provision of mandated services, audits, and as well as state reports. It's expected to grow significantly, this program, the next year. Um, the SUD programs are expanding statewide under this new drug, Medi-Cal waiver. 
the Trinity County will be joining this expansion either independently or under a regional model to expand the availability of treatment services to the community, including medication assistant treatment and residential detox services to the Medi-Cal population. So it, it's very vital to, successful, to the successful uh, operation of this program in the department. I've already met with the union, they've reviewed it, they are supporting it. This is a mid-management level salary range. We've evaluated it. It's very similar in education and training experience to a similar position in that department. And in setting the salary range, we feel it's within the classification series of the police compassion, which we've experienced. All right. Thank you. Questions? Michelle? Yes. I, I have a quick one. Shelley, do you see a benefit pro or con for doing it in independent or regionally? Um, I don't. Okay, no, thank you. Be something that I would thank you. Okay, any other comments from the public on this item? No. Seeing none, I entertain a motion. You have a motion to approve by Doc 1 as presented. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Seeing none, so moved. Thank you. Moving on to 6.1, Government Code Section 5494.5, Public Employee Evaluation Planning Council. Uh, anyone wishing to comment on this item? Hey, Grace from Lewiston. Sorry, I was still busily looking for my letter, which I still haven't found. Um, I have a question about. I did find it. Well, I'll have to show you because I. this isn't whether you guys can find it. This is whether the public can find it. And I'm not a um, novice at this, and sometimes I mess up. Okay. So I will get together with my supervisor afterwards, and he can show me where it is. Thank you. So I have a question because you're evaluating an employee for county council, and I'm just going to read this real quick for my background question. This is from a declaration of Kelly J. Snowden in support of answer to verify election contest statement. And this is a court document from case uh, 17 CB 101 where Kelly Snowden declares, I am an attorney licensed to practice before all courts in the state of California. I am a partner in the law firm of Prentice Long and Epperson PC County Council for Trinity County. So, and he's restated this in several court documents. So if you have Prentice Long and Epperson partner stating that they are county council for Trinity County, yet you are uh, evaluating an employee, who are you evaluating? If you evaluate the CAO, we know who that is. If you evaluate the de um, department, a department head, we know who that is. So you're evaluating CA or a county council when it's apparently an entire law firm, and it would be great for the public if you would clarify who exactly you are evaluating. So the contract with the county is with the law firm of Francis Long and Epperson. Uh, designated county council within that is myself, um, but the whole firm acts as county council. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you um, in September. Oh, do you have a comment on this? No, not on this. It's an urgency thing. Um, just for your board's heads up. I missed right before the department. Oh, we have a new aphid in the county. We submitted samples a week ago. I went to football practice. The team looks good, Richard. Um, so I was gone a week. The determination came back today. It's rated A, which threw me for a loop. A is like medfly, gypsy moth. We're supposed to do something. So I will try to get out and survey the county. This was up by your neighborhood. So I need to go to A Fork and jump. I need to see the other places. If the state wants to do a survey. I can probably handle Trinity's counties just here, and just want to let you give you a heads up. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And so, what was the bug they found? Is the uh, cannabis aphid. There's a hop aphid and a cannabis aphid. And apparently, we already got it, and apparently, it's already all around the county. I think it's the first year. It's worth a while for this year. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.
evaluation was held at the county council. Thank you, and meeting adjourned.